Hey, welcome to another episode of AWSP TV. We are so excited to have a special guest in our studio today from one of our best partners, Scholastic Education. We have Ernesto Rodriguez. Good to be here. We are so excited to have you here today. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your role sure. with Scholastic, if you don't mind. So currently, I'm serving as the Director of Early Childhood for Scholastic Education. And um, our emphasis is really addressing the whole child with the early childhood realm, but we are a literacy company. So we do have a huge emphasis on making that vertical alignment within the literacy world. So the way I came to be in this role was during my education years, I was a curriculum specialist and a coordinator. And we happened to adopt one of the early childhood programs that one of the previous early childhood programs developed at Scholastic Education. And as I started to really dive into the curriculum and understand the research base behind it, I really became good friends with a lot of the folks at Scholastic, but I do have a deep-rooted educational background. I taught in Edgewood ISD in San Antonio, Texas. I taught everything from pre-K to fifth. I toyed with administration. I know we're here with Principal Association, but it really wasn't. It's not too late. It's not too late. That's right. <laughs> well, I, and you know, the reality is, is that curriculum was my forte right. and I really did focus on curriculum. So became a curriculum specialist, a coordinator at the district level, working with a very, very close colleague. And when we adopted the early childhood program, I really started to believe in the early childhood research base that was part of the program and the company's mission. So. Uh, started to explore some options, and here we are. Uh, in in now, I'm helping serve in the capacity, helping serve children in this capacity, in ensuring that our resources are aligned to the best practices around research and, you know, um, addressing the whole child. Well, wow, that is awesome. Well, um, we're, like I said, excited to have you here sure. today. Uh, AWSP is one of the strongest principals associations in the country. We have about 98% of our principal members, um, K-12, are engaged in our association. Uh, the governance structure is made up of an elementary group, sure. a middle level group, and a high school group. So our elementary uh, members are really going to be focusing in on this conversation. So I'm super excited to have you here today to talk about the important role uh, early learning is in the system. Sure. Um, so anyway, excited. Yeah, me too. It's excited to be here. So you left the system, ended at Scholastic, and now you're in this director of early learning role. Mm -hmm. um, what's your vision for, I mean, what, talk about a powerful and impactful position. Sure. What's your vision of what you hope to accomplish, I guess, see as the fruit of your labor? Well, I mean, if we're talking about a vision that is specific to early childhood is have folks understand that scholastic education can support them within this world of um, early learners beyond literacy. We do have to take into account social emotional development. Mm -hmm. We have to take into account um, play, intentional and purposeful play, but also um, take into account best practices. So my role has been really focused on early childhood, but I also have to look at the larger picture, and yeah. that is establishing that vertical approach to what we do as a literacy company or, or a company that promotes the love of reading for children. Um, but it goes hand in hand. It's pretty, it's pretty much a seamless marriage. So my mission if, or my vision of what would be a perfect and seamless marriage is that, and that's what we've been doing recently in the development of our resources, is ensuring that our best practices not only speak to the unique landscape of early childhood, because mm -hmm. it is a landscape that is consistently changing, oh, yeah. but it aligns also to our public school system so children really come kinder ready or school ready. Are you seeing some exciting things happening across the country when you talk about kinder ready? Yeah, you know, the school readiness has been a term that we've been throwing around for a long time. Right. I mean, I think some of the things that have really taken shape is, of course, we have to know the child's readiness for school, but I think administrators are really beginning to take a step back and say, is my school ready for children? Mm -hmm. So is the school's readiness also available, um, ready for children? And not only the school's readiness, but how ready is our school to engage families and community members to help us with this readiness vision? Yeah. So family engagement has been at the core of a lot of recent changes. 
but um, looking at social emotional readiness as well. And I, I like to talk to them as separate entities because social readiness and emotional readiness, and we can elaborate further, but they tend to be under the same umbrella, but they really are two different things. But having our families really know that readiness doesn't always mean literacy and math. It could mean other aspects because without executive function, the kids will be struggling at third grade and beyond when they get into those, you know, reading to learn grades. Yeah, I was with a group of uh, elementary principals and assistant principals a couple weeks ago, and just you mentioned the word kindergarten to the yeah. group, and their eyes get huge you because get, yeah. uh, across our state, those numbers have just grown exponentially with the addition of more pre-K and K all-day programs around the state. Yeah. So it's really been a game changer. What advice do you have for some of those uh, wary principals who have all of these um, even smaller people in their school? Yeah, <laughs> that, and that, that is, it's interesting. I was in a school system recently where the uh, director of early childhood works with, and she actually embraces um, not just the pre-K, but also kindergarten and first grade, was working with second and third grade. And so she had a survey done at the school and was asking some intentional questions to Trump administrators. And it was funny to see the survey come up as to what they were responding on in terms of readiness and what that really, really entailed. But um, if I were to provide any advice, and I think that's ex what we're getting at here, is just ensuring that the landscape for the little ones it's understood to be a diverse landscape. There is gonna be, I mean, there are many times even in the world of early childhood or pre-K when teachers are doing cry patrol for the first three or four weeks where children are getting into a social setting for the first time. Yeah. So that's why I say readiness isn't just literacy and math. There has to be a social approach to this as well as an emotional approach to this. But the strongest piece of advice would, I, would be to really understand the landscape. I think that once we understand the landscape, from a domain perspective that goes beyond just literacy and math, then we really tend to move into conversations of the impact it's having at third grade and beyond. Um, and I mentioned that earlier because, you know, in pre-K through second, we're learning to read, and then we have to read to learn. So I know the read to learn grades are the most important grades to administrators because that's where outcomes are measured yeah. and things to that nature. But the advice would be simply to truly understand the impact to its vertical approach that it has within their school system. So just, I like to dream. So <laughs> let's envision the perfect system. Mm -hmm. If we were to take everything out of the schoolhouse and put it back in and, mm -hmm. and we dismantle old antiquated systems of how we've approached education for years, um, what's possible? I mean, what would that ideal system look like? Well, there's a couple of things that I have to embrace that are happening in the landscape now. Um, you mentioned earlier that you'd met with administrators. I know that Washington is exploring the transitional kindergarten mm -hmm. um, arena, so to speak, and there are other states that have embraced that notion. And I know that in Washington also there are Head Start collaborations with the public school systems, and there is that is a very unique landscape. So in a perfect world, I think that partnerships and collaborations would be a true, true indicator if, because children entered through eligibility requirements and or um, accessibility for pre-K, um, in a perfect setting, it would be a universal pre-K approach mm. that would really embrace the collaborations and take into account those children who aren't of age to attend kindergarten place for them. So I, I applaud the efforts of transitional kindergarten. Yeah. And then we can really ensure that kids are ready for kinder when we help empower families, that school is not enough instruction alone just by attending school, that they also have to be empowered to help extend the learning at home. And I think that's probably what my dream world would be is understanding collaborations, truly understanding what do we do for those children that are gray area of either eligibility or accessibility or age requirements and providing a systematic approach for yeah. them. Well, when you talk about Head Start, yeah. and ECAP and, and Transitional K, mm -hmm. those are all great things that uh, as, as I listen to you talk, I, I'm 
envisioning the end yeah. of the system, um, you're talking about impacting grad rates. Yeah, Because definitely. we're putting all of this emphasis on the front end of the system. That is exactly right. And, you know, occasionally we do have some legislators that are watching this show, so hopefully they just heard you talk about maybe that's where we need to put our resources is more on the transitional side. Oh, I, I think that that is something that is definitely in conversations now with legislators around the country. I think that one of the things that has been misconstrued is the topic around readiness mm -hmm. and what does that truly entail. And there's a lot of research that supports children at the grade and beyond don't even have executive function skills put into place on how to self-regulate and deal with emotions that aren't letting them be successful in school. And when children are struggling readers or struggling learners, it becomes cyclical. So children don't have the ability to control those emotions. And those are skills that we teach early on. And so earlier when you asked me if, what should administrators do, is really understand how this could impact grades later, third grade and beyond, yeah. and your graduation rates. Yeah. It, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is a cyclical approach to readiness. Yeah, I remember uh, being a struggling reader myself in okay. elementary school. I was, I was that kid. Okay. I remember being in the pulled out group, you know, sitting out in the pod, That's looking right. at all my classmates. Uh, I remember being afraid to read out loud in class, so mm -hmm. I, would, uh, I would create behavioral distractions now sure. that I look back. Rocking the boat. I spent a lot of time <laughs> with my school administrators. Yeah. Uh, so when you think about the resources sure. of Scholastic, mm -hmm. um, Principal churn's a huge issue in the state and across the country. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of new administrators. Yeah. Um, so they, they go from the classroom and then all of a sudden they're in charge of a whole school. Um, what are some of the resources that you're excited about that yeah. you're working with Scholastic uh, that you guys are putting together with other partners that um, you think should be in every school? Yeah, one of the things that I think is really exciting about our resource bank right now is we are in development with, um, we have a collaboration with Yale Child Study Center mm. focused on uh, family resiliency and the impact liter it'll have on literacy and the notion behind readiness as a whole um, and a few other partnerships that are um, through the Erickson Institute and uh, who is one of the members there as part of the NACI governing board is the development of our new early childhood program, Pre-K on My Way. Uh, that's not released yet, but we've been knee deep in development for a couple of years. In the interim, because we knew that some of our thought partners needed support around social emotional readiness, where we have an array of libraries that are tied competencies that most social emotional programs embrace, um, we've developed library collections around social emotional development. We've also developed an array of resources around family and community engagement. Uh, that's probably one of the areas I'm most excited about because my passion runs really deep in empowering families. I worked in a school system. I, I mentioned Edgewood ISD in San Antonio. It is one of the lowest SES areas in the city of San Antonio and one of the worst districts in the state of Texas. And I saw families that really could have used some of the resources that we have yeah. now. So family and community engagement resources, we have readiness um, kits, transition packs, that have books with family suggested activities to help empower them at home. But another area that I think we've been really successful in aligning our resources to is that intentional small group focus. We have a new resource called EDGE. Um, it's a pre-K through six. And what I'm excited about is that we, although it has um, pre, it has leveled readers in the pre-K domain, we've made sure that we kept it developmentally appropriate and it's got wordless books and label books and simple sentence structure with pictorial support but the reason i mention that is because i think a pre-k program can run very successfully with the play and the center-based activities and the you know the social emotional development but it's that intentional small group focus yeah. that really relies on the transference into a larger setting so I'm really excited about the edge resource and it's um, edge for pre-k and edge for K through six and um, that's one of the things that I've been really excited about but I have to circle back to family engagement yeah we, we've worked really hard 
to ensure that our resources are built and designed to empower families. We've got workshops where families can come and they are not only intend attending a workshop, but being empowered and then leaving with books at the end of the evening or the afternoon whenever the event is held so that they can go home and extend the learning. So those are some of the areas that I think we've really excelled in recently. And as I mentioned, we're developing a comprehensive approach to our, for our thought partners for pre-K. That's excellent. Principals in our state are evaluated. One of the eight criteria mm -hmm. is uh, engaging community, engaging families. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure some ears were perking up as you were describing yeah. all the resources for that. that. That's a trend that I've seen. That's a common denominator that I've seen across the country right now is some level of self-assessment mm -hmm. on whether we are doing parent touch points. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing around those parent touch points is that the opportunity to touch them is not just check the box and we had them here and now they're gone, is really following that research base of empowerment. And again, I probably elaborated on that the most because it is something we've excelled at at Scholastic Education. Yeah, you think about the traditional open houses that have existed yeah. in schools for decades. Have you seen any, any school do anything creative around uh, engaging families in yeah. that non-traditional approach besides, hey, 6.30 tonight is our open house. That's right. Come yeah. walk through your, your child's schedule for the day. And we'll, right, <laughs> we'll say we had it. Yeah, no, one of the things that has um, been really exciting with some of our thought partners is actually building in-house capacity first. So aside from our resources, we're able to provide professional learning um, opportunities based on the research of Dr. Karen Mapp out of Harvard University mm. on the dual capacity framework. And that speaks to empowerment. Um, but the reality is, is that I think, I'm, I'm thinking as a certain thought partner that we're working with very closely, through their um, Title I funds and their state, the Director of State um, Title I funds, yeah, Director of State and Title I, she actually has a parenting program underneath her. And so what she decided to do was l lobby and, and advocate for liaisons to treat the clusters of schools, because mm -hmm. it's a growing district. And instead of just purchasing an array of resources and handing those out, she has invested in Scholastic Education coming to partner with that group of liaisons to build their internal capacity of truly what does empowerment mean and how do we get families involved, but also to help develop family engagement plans that are tied to the instructional goals of the campuses so that it becomes wow. a win-win for everyone. And that's work that I think is very innovative when an administrator or a leader at the district level can see. And of course we have to, you know, march to the tune of their drum in terms of buy-in because that's a new world for some administrators but we have been able to be successful in in mostly aligning our their family engagement plan to their instructional campus goals so that there is that seamless marriage so those are some of the unique things that I've seen that that's a far stretch from we had a literacy night or an open house <laughs> right then yeah. you know and and actually that initiative is those liaisons are pre-k through fifth grade taking care of the elementary clusters but they targeted pre-k and k first wow. so they could make that impact and then they're going to scaffold it up into the uh, to the other grades that's excellent yeah i want to go back to the whole child conversation yeah. just quickly here and um social emotional learning sure uh i know you're seeing the trend across the country but schools are working to reduce out of school suspensions, reduce in school suspensions, keep kids in classrooms. Um, so there's a real intentional effort to reduce those numbers. What it's turning into, and I'm hearing this loud and clear from my members, is uh, our principals and assistant principals have a whole bunch of kids that they're kind of getting during the day mm -hmm. that need to be out of the class a little bit mm -hmm. while they calm down, cool down, collect themselves, whatever. Um, what advice would you have for yeah. a principal or assistant principal or what resources or, you know, I guess I dream that one day Scholastic will send every principal 
you know, a, like, <laughs> like a little kit of books, like, hey, here are your de-escalation yeah, books. Yeah, here are your de-escalation <laughs> books. So, so what, yeah. what ideas or books or resources or thoughts would you have for principals who kind of end up with their buildings during yeah, the day? Yeah, that is, that, is, that is a case that is still too common. Um, I'm going to go back to an example that is personal. At one point in my career, I served as a reading interventionist mm -hmm. and under No Child Left Behind. And that role meant that I, for a percentage of my day, I would pull out kinder and first grade students yeah. that needed intervention, so to speak. And I wasn't opposed to that because there were some benefits from a pullout model. Yeah. But the reason I mentioned that is because it wasn't until I started doing that real isolated focus that I realized a lot of this isn't even about reading. It, some of it is, I mean, we do have to embrace phonological awareness and letter sound recognition. At a very, kids can't transfer the 26 letters to the 44 sounds automatically. That is instruction. But what I did feel in those, no child, those groups under No Child, yeah. that, that role that I was doing as an interventionist, that a lot of my kids were struggling because it was just cyclical. Yeah. And they had not, what should have been in working, what should have been moved to long-term memory where automaticity skills with sight words and things of that nature were not. Mm -hmm. And so when I say the whole child and we want administrators to understand, I think if the advice that I would have is just to embrace a very explicit and systematic approach pre-K on up. I know of school systems in Washington that are doing it pre-K through eighth with a very systematic social emotional development plan mm. that really focuses on socialization because there's benefits to social competence and social awareness as well as executive function, self-awareness and self-regulation. Those are two separate things, but having children engaged with each other, we always used to use the word groups and learning communities, but there is much more to that social competence aspect, especially today we're fighting social media. You know, children today are more engaged with digital media than they are with digital and mobile devices than each other. So really embracing and ingraining themselves and understanding how the social emotional development plan will benefit the other outcomes down the road. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned it's going to bring up anyway, but so if I'm a parent and I'm watching this mm. and, uh, my little one has a device in their hand yeah. and I want to get that device out and a book in. Um, what are some strategies or suggestions you have for the parents that might be watching this? Yeah, th that's, that's a topic that comes up and we know that there's strong recommendations from many organizations as to what applicable screen time should be and some even say zero at 24 months and under, you know, so, um, but I know that it varies up at three years and above because of there could be intentional screen time. So the advice that I would have for parents is, you know, there's always opportunities for literacy being folded into the day, especially in pre-K K and first grade. Um, there could be literacy in the kitchen when there's magnetic letters being utilized on the refrigerator or cookie tray. Um, of course, it's our job to teach the phonological awareness continuum, but if they can at least help with letter identification, and un knowing what letters are, but there's opportunities that are seen in the living room, maybe before they turn on that mobile device. Uh, you know, some say the chief culprit behind the achievement gap is the language gap. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, before you turn on that mobile device, maybe have a good 10 minute meaningful exchange with the child about a favorite topic or school just to engage them in discourse literacy out and about. I mean, I think our little ones would really benefit from exploring environmental print and um, being engaged in, in conversations. So there's a lot of suggestions, but I would just have to say that I think that families also should really view any opportunity at school to try to empower themselves so that they can take the instruction back home or take the ability to extend the learning to home. Um, I, I said it earlier, instruction alone is not enough. The eight hour day, the six hour day, whatever it is. And in some pre-K settings, we're down to a half day of instruction. Right. So that's not enough. And I think anything that a family can do to incorporate simple activities and anything the schools can do to help empower them 
would be a win-win. So the word scholastic is huge. Very, yeah. <laughs> so if I wanted to just explore some of the resources that are out there, mm -hmm. do I just start with a simple Google search or is there a, is there a, a central landing point where somebody would kind of yeah. begin to look? So, yeah, no, well, the Google search will take you to our website. I mean, my <laughs> Microsoft partners would want me to say a Bing search. Yeah. So I just want to make sure <laughs> yeah, I sure. said that, too. But uh, the, um, any, any search would take you to a massive navigation page, but we do have an early learning division. Okay. And, um, you know, it's scholastic.com early learning. Then that scholastic education division, that's where most of the resources that I've spoken to would okay. relate. Um, we will be at NACI, which is the National Association for the Education of Young Children, next week. Um, well, November 20th through the 22nd. And then um, we'll have many of our resources on display there. But uh, the early learning, scholastic.com early learning, would be a great place to go for our early childhood resources. And then we have a acronym for our family engagement at Scholastic Education that's called Scholastic FACE. Uh, family and community engagement. So it's an acronym that you could probably search and you would get to our family engagement resources. That's fantastic. I, I can hear the pencils yeah. scribbling out there. <laughs> okay. Except for those that are watching this while they're driving. <laughs> Which is not safe. Which is not safe either. <laughs> not safe. <laughs> <laughs> so could you give me a little bit about your, your own um, K-12 experience? Yeah. Well, and how that might have shaped who you are and where you are today. Yeah. Well, I was a product of San Antonio Independent School District in San Antonio, Texas. And um, I'd have to say that, you know, I was in a feeder pattern that was very well aligned with a lot of what was happening in the landscape. And when I say that is, it was a mixture of, um, low SES students with a mixture of middle class students and some more affluent students. So mm -hmm. that, that was back in the day. Uh, things have changed, demographics have changed. And the reason I mention that is because I did have the opportunity to engage with people just like myself right. and or other demographics. Yeah. So I've never really seen color. I've never seen you know differences in demographics. I just had friends. And the, the reason I connect in that way is because I think that's impacted me that I just wanna help all kids. I just wanna help all teachers and administrators in really just seeing an opportunity out there to build success for kids. Mm -hmm. um, we had a work program in my high school that you could go half day and half day you had to work, you know, if you had enough credits. And I ended up landing a job at an early childhood center. Oh, wow. And I was that after school care guy. I was the run the errands guy, but I was always around children. And I'd have to tell you, that's where my passion started. That's oh. where my passion started for the little ones. Uh, I have a little bit of a creative side to me and would organize plays and, you know, shows with the kiddos. And so it just, it really, structured where I was going in terms of, of early childhood, but my school systems, um, pre-K, I mean my elementary school system that was Horseman Middle School, Marvin B. Fenwick Elementary, Horseman Middle School, Thomas Jefferson, this is a big shout out. I remember the names, I remember everything about them because it just provided a great experience. I had, I had administrators, I had teachers that truly believed in all of us from an equitable standpoint. Yeah. And that is important that we focus on each and every and all. I know there's lots of battle yeah. around what language we use. Um, and, you know, I appreciate you bringing up that, <laughs> that you didn't see color as a kid. Yeah. Um, but I think what's encouraging now is we have a system that does see color and yeah. has to see color. Yeah. And when you think about the resources that Scholastic are starting to create yeah. that are culturally competent. That's right. And kids can relate to characters. Um, I was, you know, I guess it broke my heart a little bit when I was talking with a junior student in a high school one day and she says, yeah, when I finally, it was like Water for Chocolate was the book. She says, the first time I've ever read anything where I could see myself as a character in the book. And we've had to create culturally responsive libraries 
We have our brand new Raising Voices libraries, and they are targeted to have children of color see themselves in those books, yeah. including Latinos. Mm -hmm. And I am Mexican American, and the reality is is that I had the ability to overcome whatever I wasn't seeing simply because I had good instruction around me. But you are exactly right. The tenor of today calls for children seeing themselves and can feel a part of this society and world. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been an awesome conversation. I appreciate I just it. Really appreciate you yeah. coming all the way from San Antonio to the ASP studio. Well, I live in, in Austin Olympia. now. I mean, in Austin. <laughs> but let me tell you still, why. Still, that's a long way. It's still a long way. I, I call San Antonio home, but I live in Austin because I did my undergraduate at the University of Texas, and I'm a diehard Longhorn fan. So that's why I went back to Austin. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, nobody gets a studio without answering kind of this one final question I okay. always ask people. Um, I'm a big believer in the role principles play in our system, and I don't think uh, the system pays enough yeah. attention to that important role. We are the number two influencer on student achievement and sure. uh, the culture we create in schools. Um, so I am always thinking back on who influenced me in my life, and I can name the names and who and where, sure. th where those entry points were in my life. So I love to ask people um, who their favorite principal was because everyone always gets asked who their teacher was, favorite teacher or coach, but I like to insert the word principal. Um, so can you think back to your time and think of I, a principal who had an impact in your life? I can, I can. It's my elementary school principal, and it's not specifically elementary because I work with early childhood and early learning. It was because of the impact he made. Um, I don't even think I remember my high school principal's name, which is not good, but my elementary principal was Mr. Kelly and we used to call him Mr. Cat. And there was a, that was a gentleman that I know for sure just saw all the positives in every single one of those kids he possibly, I mean, that man was there way before schools opened and way after it closed. Uh, he, he really just embraced everything there was about a good leader and I will forever remember him. He was a pretty awesome. Right on. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. Sure. Again, thanks for being here today and the impact that you're having on the system. Thank you. I get excited when I think about what it could look like in five years yeah. with this emphasis on early learning yeah, sure. and what our high schools could feel like in 10 years. That's right. Because of this impact and yeah. influence of early learning. So a good time. Thank anyway, you. Ernesto Rodriguez from Scholastic. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of ADSP TV. Who knows who our might be? Could be Oprah. <laughs> Ellen DeGeneres, <laughs> um, you know, I'm aiming big, so thanks again, sure. tune in next time.